Good morning and welcome to day two of this public meeting of the Physician Focused Payment Technical Advisory Committee, known as PTAC. I'd like to welcome members of the public who are participating today, whether by WebEx, phone, or live stream. Thank you all for your interest in PTAC. If you have technical questions during the meeting, please reach out to the host via the chat function in WebEx or email. And the email address is ptacregistration at norc.org with any questions. Again, that's PTAC registration at norc.org. I extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. Yesterday, we deliberated and voted on two proposals. And for today, we have organized a number of virtual sessions to gather current perspectives on telehealth and alternative payment models. At our last public meeting in June, I shared the new vision statement the committee has drafted to describe the various ways we see our work as contributing to improving the U.S. healthcare delivery system. PTAC is a forum in which stakeholders in the field can convey their ideas regarding new payment and care delivery models that are informed by their experience. Those of you who tuned into yesterday's session saw the latest examples of how this plays out. Our vision statement also mentioned our plans to expand our communications with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, and stakeholders in order to further inform policy makers both in and out of government. We are intending to engage in depth, in, engage in depth discussions of important topics. As the committee has reviewed the proposals we have received, we have noted common themes that have emerged across multiple proposals from a variety of stakeholders. As part of this effort, we have organized today's agenda to explore a theme that has spanned several past proposals, telehealth. In response to the coronavirus pandemic, CMS instituted several flexibilities in its regulations pertaining to telemedicine that have enabled an unprecedented utilization of telehealth services, affirming its feasibility and its usability. These changes are likely to have far-reaching impacts long after the pandemic has passed. So now is an optimal time to investigate lessons learned from recent experiences and how they might inform future policymaking. Within that context, PTAC feels that the, <clears throat> the work of previous submitters who included telehealth technologies as part of their proposed alternative payment models should be looked at with fresh eyes not to re-deliberate on these proposals, but to learn more from the field about how telemedicine may impact alternative payment models, especially given the recent regulatory changes. In addition to understanding how previous models have incorporated telehealth, we have commissioned an environmental scan on telehealth and payment policy that is available on the ASPE PTAC website on the meeting page. To offer some context to help frame our discussion, NORC, ASPE's support contractor, will present an overview of how previous models proposed to PTAC incorporated telehealth. Then we have organized a panel of six previous submitters. Again, this is not a re-deliberation of their proposals, but a unique opportunity to hear from stakeholders who have been thinking about telehealth and payment policy since long before the pandemic. After a short break, we will then have a panel of additional subject matter experts to gather an even broader range of perspectives. When we return from our break, we will have a public comment period to hear additional input and perspectives on telehealth. Comments will be limited to two minutes each so that we can maximize the number of participants. If you have not registered in advance to give an oral public comment but would like to, please email PTAC registration at norc.org. Again, that's PTAC registration at norc.org. We also encourage stakeholders to submit public comments on telehealth by emailing them to ptac at hhs.gov. Again, you are welcome to submit public comments about telehealth in writing to ptac at hhs.gov. We intend to post any written public input we receive online. Finally, we have some time for the committee to discuss and share any closing thoughts on the day's events before adjourning. 
Taken together, the environmental scan, panel discussions, and public comments are aimed at informing PTAC about the most current knowledge and perspectives on how telehealth itself can be optimized, how its use can in turn optimize healthcare delivery, and further the transformation of value-based care with alternative payment models. A culmination of today's discussions, capturing the perspectives we will hear today, will be available online in the coming weeks. We have a packed agenda, so I'm eager to get started. As part of the effort to develop their environmental scan on optimizing telehealth and the interplay of telehealth for transforming value-based care through alternative payment models, NORC reviewed previous proposals that have been submitted to PTAC for evaluation that included telehealth, telemedicine, and or telemonitoring technologies as part of the care delivery model within them and interviewed the submitters. To share their findings about these proposals, I'm gonna turn it over to Adil Modudin, Senior Vice President at Newark at the University of Chicago to present. Adil. Thank you, Dr. Bailet. I'm happy to present an overview of proposals submitted to PTAC that included a telehealth component. Next slide. Between December 2016 and March 2020, 36 physician-focused payment model proposals were submitted to PTAC. Excluding those proposals currently under review, 18 of these proposals included telehealth as a component. This includes five proposals that included telehealth as a central feature of the proposed model, nine that included telehealth as an aspect of care delivery or the payment model itself, and four that included telehealth as an optional component of the model or mentioned the potential for using telehealth services under the model. This presentation summarizes the characteristics of these models taken from an environmental scan on the topic of telehealth in the context of APMs commissioned by PTAC that can be accessed on the ASPE PTAC website at the URL listed. This work uses the definition of telehealth used by the Office of the Advancement of Telehealth at the Health Resources and Services Administration namely the use of electronic information and telecommunication technologies to support long distance clinical health care, patient and professional health related education, public health and health administration. It includes telehealth services authorized through Medicare as telehealth or telecommunications, which may include live or synchronous exchange of information and use of asynchronous exchange of information. Separately, the definition also includes technologies that create a continuous feed for ongoing analysis. Next slide. To start with some of the key takeaways, the analysis showed that PTAC submissions with the telehealth component varied by population served and settings of care. These submissions envisioned use of different telehealth modalities with many proposals, including more than one telehealth modality. The submissions emphasized that telehealth is a tool that can be used as part of a broader model to improve access to care and improve quality of care. And finally, the PTAC telehealth related proposals incorporated a variety of different payment models. Taking a step back, the purpose of this analysis is to describe lessons learned from previous PTAC submissions related to telehealth and identify features and common elements across these proposals. The analysis included a review of the proposals themselves, reports to the secretary, the secretary's responses, preliminary review team reports, and a targeted search of other PTAC process documents. Finally, the broader environmental scan is informed by discussions with 13 of the 18 submitters that proposed a model with a telehealth component that is part of this analysis. This is the full list of 18 submitters included in the analysis. I'm not going to read all of the words on the slide. These slides are posted as part of the meeting materials. And there are more details uh, regarding these proposals in the e-scan. If you're interested in diving into the details, Appendix, six, uh, Appendix C of the e-scan rather provides information about each of these proposals and the way they incorporated telehealth. As noted earlier, these 18 models varied in terms of the conditions and populations they focused on as well as, as the relevant settings of care and the proposed telehealth modality. They address the needs of patients with chronic conditions, emergency care, care for serious illness, 
primary care, long-term care, and care transitions. They also encompass the full range of relevant telehealth modalities, including synchronous telehealth using video and phone, mobile health, remote patient monitoring, and other asynchronous telehealth services. Proposals emphasize the idea that telehealth is a tool that when used in the context of a full model can increase access to and quality of specialty care in rural or remote areas, provide enhanced access to providers via telephone, video conferencing, smartphone applications, and other tools, reduce, reduce the burden of face-to-face -face visits for patients and providers, improve care coordination and care delivery through electronic communication between care team members and specialists, and improve patient engagement using secure messaging and digital communications platforms. The review also found that PTAC made favorable assessments of the use of telehealth in six reports to the secretary. The committee's remarks emphasized data sharing opportunities created by health IT and telehealth, noted opportunities to use telehealth to create efficiencies for providers, and highlighted use of telehealth to support higher quality of care, enable greater or earlier intervention, and finally support reductions in ED visits, hospitalizations, and mortality. I'm going to end here, but there is an additional slide that's posted on the website that summarizes the 18 proposals based on their telehealth modality, condition, and setting of care. And as a reminder, please feel free to review that as well as the environmental scan. Thank you, Otto, for that presentation. Uh, as Otto said, NORC interviewed 13 of the 18 submitters who had incorporated some type of telehealth in their proposals. As much as we would have liked to have host all of them here today because of logistical constraints, we've asked six former submitters to join today's discussion and share their insights and lessons learned from the public health crisis about telehealth. I want to note one last time that this is not a redeliberation of their proposals. Rather, the information gleaned from NORC's review and this discussion will serve to inform PTAC on future proposals and its recommendations and comments to the Secretary on physician-focused payment models. For this panel, we have several questions in the queue for each panelist to respond. We will work through each question and PTAC members will have an opportunity to ask any follow-up questions before we move on to the next question. I'll ask that each panelist try to their best to keep their responses to just a couple of minutes or so for each question. I would like to welcome each of the panelists. You can find their full biographies on the meetings page of the ASPE PTAC website. Um, first, I, I'd like to introduce Dr. Barbara McNaney from Innovative Oncology Business Solutions. Next, we have Heidi Robertson Cooper representing the American Academy of Family Physicians. We also are joined by Stetson Berg from the University of New Mexico Sciences Center. Uh, that's Health Sciences Center. And, and next we have Jeffrey Davis re representing the American College of Emergency Physicians. And we also have Dr. Lawrence Pazinski from Sonar MD. And finally, we're joined by David Basel of Avera Health. Um, thank you all for joining us. So, um, the first question, what, what, what we're going to do is um, we'll, we'll go in order, starting with Barbara. Um, the, first, the first question is please provide a brief description on how telehealth was incorporated into your proposed physician-focused payment model. Thank you. Barbara, you're on mute. One more time with feeling, Barbara. <laughs> You're still on mute. It keeps muting me again. I know there's a there's a gremlin there's a gremlin there, but uh, hopefully we'll get that. I'll keep watching, and if the microphone turns red, I'll I'll 
tap it again. Right. So I'm Barbara McEnany. I'm Innovative Oncology Business Solutions. And my proposal was MASON, stands for Making Accountable Sustainable Oncology Networks. And this built off the previous CMMI award I had had in 2012 called Come Home for Community Oncology Medical Home, where we estimated savings of about $600 per patient in cancer patients by early intervention to keep them out of the hospital by managing the side effects of cancer and its treatment very aggressively so that patients never needed that. We incorporated that into Mason as well. As we worked through the oncology care model, we found that uh, more important than anything the physician did was the whether or not a patient came in with a lot of pre-existing conditions and other problems that made them more expensive to treat. So Mason is a project that uses the clinical data of 12 of 18 contributing oncology practices and the claims data to create accurate target prices for optimally delivered cancer care. So when physicians are then freed from the concerns about whether the patient I I just saw in my office is going to be sicker than most or less, but with an accurate target price, we can really focus on reaching out and making sure that we do the best job we can to manage that patient's care. So when we started this, telemedicine, frankly, was not a very useful tool because we were required to have the patient in a clinic in order to use telemedicine, which doesn't help me in this process. When we were freed up during the pandemic and able to use telemedicine for patients at home, that helped us to have valuable information about those patients to come in. It's a tool to use. It was especially important when we be, were able to use the telephone because many of my patients, for example, live out on the Navajo reservation where there is no cellular service and there is no uh, broadband for using visual telehealth. But we were able to use this modality to figure out who needed to get to the right side of service. And that is really the key, I think, to healthcare savings, is to use hospitals, if and only if hospitals are needed, to bring people into my office, if and only if I can't manage what's going on with them at home. So telemedicine becomes a very valuable tool for us to have more of an assessment. There, there's a, a lot of comment these days about trying to get uh, or patient data coming into the practices, but I think that's only part of the issue. We not only need the patient experience, but we need a mechanism to evaluate what's going on with that experience to make sure every comment they send us is acknowledged and responded to and managed appropriately. So telehealth has become a very valuable tool for us in determining which patients need the more um, important and more uh, ad advantageous in-person visit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Um, next, we have Heidi. Good morning, everyone. I'm Heidi Robertson Cooper. I'm the Division Director for Practice Advancement at the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, in 2018, the AAFP submitted the Advanced Primary Care Alternative Payment Model for PTAX consideration. Um, and regarding that, our model, uh, it had four distinct payment mechanisms. Um, it included a primary care global payment. It also included a population-based payment um, that was prospectively paid and risk-adjusted. Um, there was also a performance-based incentive payment that was reconciled quarterly, um, and it also included quality and cost measures. And then last, there were uh, minimal fee-for-service patients, or excuse me, minimal fee-for-service payments um, as necessary for um, some specific procedures. Um, regarding this um, payment model, Telehealth was not explicitly um, incorporated into the model. However, um, making the practice revenue um, more of a prospective risk adjustment per patient per month amount 
our model sought to provide practices with the maximum flexibility to deliver care in the ways that most made sense for their patients. Um, and this includes telehealth um, along with other modalities. So this approach um, really uh, drives the idea that um, flexible payment allows for more flexible ways to deliver care while meeting patients' needs, whether that's in a pandemic or outside of a pandemic with just um, regular primary care. I would say that this is consistent. This model is consistent with um, the AAFP's telehealth and telemedicine policy. That payment model should support the patient's freedom of choice um, in the form of services preferred and delivered. Um, and additionally, um, we also believe that payment models should support the physician's ability to direct the patient towards the appropriate, appropriate service modality um, with adequate reimbursement according to the standard of care. So we believe that technology used to deliver these services should not be a consideration, uh, should not only be the consideration that's included, but it should be what's needed to provide medically reasonable and necessary care. And I will also say this payment model um, is designed to be comprehensive and support um, coordinated, continuous, um, and comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Stetson Berg. Good morning, everyone. Um, the University of New Mexico Health Science Center telehealth model was specifically built around the telehealth delivery, and our proposal focuses on remote assessment of neuroemergent conditions and trauma at hospitals that lack neurologists and neurosurgeons. As such, telehealth was integral to our project and our payment model. Uh, we also deliver education to the facilities that we work with. It's about 22 different rural sites. And we found that in just transportation alone, we saved payers over $250 million over the last five years. Thank you, Stetson. Uh, Jeffrey Davis. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Davis. Thank you so much for having me this morning. I work at the American College of Emergency Physicians, or ASAP. Uh, in 2018, ASEP created the Acute Unscheduled Care Model, AUCM model, or AWESOME model, like we like to call it. It's structured as a bundled payment model, focusing on specific episodes of an unscheduled acute care. The overall goal of the model is to improve the ability of emergency physicians to reduce inpatient admissions and observation stays when appropriate through enhanced care coordination. Emergency physicians under the model will become key members of the care continuum as the model focuses on ensuring follow-up care for emergency patients, minimizing redundant post-emergency department services, and avoiding post-emergency department discharge safety events that lead to follow-up ED visits or inpatient admissions. So all in all, the awesome model provides the necessary tools and resources to emergency person groups to help ensure that certain patients who otherwise might have been hospitalized and have expensive inpatient admission can be safely discharged from emergency departments and overall have positive outcomes once they're discharged. One such tool that Dawson provides to participants is a set of waivers, which includes um, telehealth waiver that would allow emergency physicians to provide follow-up telehealth services when a beneficiary has been discharged and is at their home. The telehealth waiver can also be used when patients are transferred to another facility. For example, Emergency physicians can use the waiver to follow up with patients who are sent to rehabilitation centers or assisted living facilities that may have telehealth capabilities in place. And I'll get to in future questions about the role of the COVID-19 pandemic, but that's uh, and how that's kind of changed our thinking of telehealth later on. But thank you so much for having me again. Uh, you bet. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, Larry. Got on, we've got to unmute you, Larry. There we go. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for including my, me and uh, Sonar MD in, in the uh, proposals this morning that are being presented. I do believe Sonar MD, uh, the, the project Sonar model was the first approved 
position focused payment model back in April of 2017. And it was a joint initiative of the Illinois Gastroenterology Group and Sonar MD, a company I founded back in 2016. In the Sonar model, an attributed population of enrolled patients proactively receives monthly symptom surveys, which are a set of structured questions from a clinically validated index specific to their condition. They are sent via an SMS texting or email platform. Benchmarks are set for the symptom scores and the slopes of change in those scores over time. The surveys return a symptom intensity score, which are then proactively monitored against the benchmarks set by the sonar care coordinators. Patients who have scores that exceed these benchmarks are contacted virtually and multimodally by the care coordinators using a structured set of follow-up questions based on the details of their survey. The results of these care coordinator telehealth visits are then used to create an equally structured alert, which is sent to the medical practice. Guideline-based clinical services are then provided by the medical practice using their traditional workflow on the basis of these care coordinator alerts. Services can include the typical office visits, telehealth visits, phone visits, uh, and care provided can be testing, changes in medications, procedures, et cetera. The results of these interventions are then fed back to the sonar team in a structured fashion to close the alert. Timely claims data is made available to sonar so the results of our care coordination can be then correlated with changes in utilization and cost. The deployment of the sonar platform has consistently resulted in significant, statistically significant savings in total cost driven by an equally statistically significant decline in hospitalizations, ER visits, and outpatient care. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Um, last, we have David. All right, thank you, Chair. Again, this is Dave Basil with Avera Health. And our project similarly was based off of a CMMI Healthcare Innovation Award. And our clinical delivery program was called E-Long-Term Care. And that revolved around taking a set of very limited resources, such as a geriatric-led multidisciplinary team that included social work, pharmacy, geriatric-trained advanced practice providers, uh, behavioral health, infectious disease, and delivering that into nursing homes via two-way audio video technology. And so over the multiple years that this was going on, we ramped up to over 75 nursing homes that this was deployed into, and it really enabled us to provide that very limited set of resources. In our home state of South Dakota, there are fewer than 10 geriatricians board certified. And so to be able to provide those limited resources, whether that's infectious disease, behavioral health, and that multidisciplinary approach in a nursing home would just be impossible on a in-person capability, especially in rural areas and even urban areas. So by utilizing telemedicine to provide that, we're able to scale that out and provide that to multiple settings. Um, not only are we providing in-person care, but we're providing a lot of systematic education in the nursing homes, and we've become a big part of the quality improvement processes in those nursing homes, which as we'll talk about later, was key to be able to fight COVID. And so we were really well situated for COVID. Still waiting to see the overall uh, CMMI evaluation officially of our program, but our internal data, we were able to show a 30% reduction in ED visits, as well as a $342 per member per month uh, savings on the Medicare members enrolled in this project. Great, thanks, David. Um, we're gonna move on to the next question. Uh, and there's a little bit here to unpack, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and go slow. Uh, I hopefully you guys have the questions in front of you as well. Um, but it would be informative to think through lessons learned from the public health crisis related to your proposed model and its components pertaining to telehealth in relation to transforming care delivery, propelling value-based transformation, and enabling provider resilience. For each of you, given the recent experiences resulting from the pandemic, 
Can you comment on how your telehealth component may inform lessons learned more broadly? In other words, how might your component and the associated alternative payment model help foster value-based transformation and resilience? In your opinion, and given your expertise, what are facilitators or key features of an alternative payment model that are particularly important for supporting the telehealth aspects of your proposal. And finally, under the, health, under the telehealth related Medicare fee for service waivers implemented during the public health emergency, would an alternative payment model of the kind you proposed still be needed? Why or why not? So I understand there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Barbara, and that gives the rest of the panelists a little bit of an opportunity to put their thoughts together, but go ahead, Barbara. Okay, well, since our savings are predicated on really effectively managing patients at the lowest cost side of service and using higher cost side of services only when absolutely necessary, telehealth can become a very valuable tool. So with the pandemic, it remained important for oncology practices to manage neutropenic fever because the usual comment of, if you have a fever, stay home, doesn't work for neutropenic patients on chemotherapy. And if they stay home, they will die, often in septic shock. So the question that we had to incorporate into our processes was how do you keep COVID positive patients treated and managed without exposing the other immunosuppressed patients in your center, but not letting chemotherapy induced neutropenia kill your patients. We also recognize that if our patients went to the hospital, a cancer patient has a significantly higher chances of contracting COVID and dying. So we took the assumption that it was our job to our patients to keep them out of the hospital and to our community to keep cancer patients away from the hospital so they could focus on COVID. And we succeeded pretty well on doing both of those things. We use telemedicine and especially the telephonic part to assess people first. So what we would do with anyone who called up with some with a, a concern about I'm sick, I have a fever, I have a cough, I have any of the COVID symptoms, I can't taste anything, we would evaluate them first by telemedicine. If we also looked at other risk factors like likelihood of neutropenia or they were having a purulent sputum and could have a bacterial pneumonia, we were able to structure it so they would come to the office, uh, be greeted at the door, as they would text us as soon as they got there, be greeted at the door, taken to an isolation room, where a, a clinician in full protective equipment would see them and evaluate them. If they were neutropenic, everyone got tested for COVID, but if they were neutropenic, they also were started on intravenous antibiotics. We were able to keep our patients out of the hospital very well. So under the Mason model, that would translate to significant savings. Uh, we did it more because this is a way we could keep our patients safe and we've actually had pretty good results with doing that. I think I got all the unpacked parts of your questions, but if I left anything out, let me know. Nice, nice job, Barbara. And, and before we move to the next question, I wanna make sure that um, I give our PTAC colleagues the opportunity to ask you guys questions. So I'm sure our colleagues are taking notes as, we, uh, as you guys go ahead and answer this particular question. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Heidi. Hey, so for the first question um, around how might um, the APM that we submitted um, facilitate or um, help with the lessons learned more broadly based from the PEG. Um, so, so to respond to that, we really believe that the primary feature in our model um, that would have facilitated te uh, telehealth was the payment methodology, um, which was much less focused on fee for service. Um, than current payment methodology. So for example, um, telehealth services in our model would have been covered by the prospective risk-based um, population-based payment um, that was represented by what we call the primary care global payment, um, as well as the population-based payment. 
So we feel very strongly that if this model um, were then implemented, that the rapid adoption of telehealth um, would have been um, a, list, a little bit less rapid um, because they family physicians would have had the flexibility to provide care um, by the telehealth modality um, in advance of the PHE instead of being prompted um, by the PHE. Um, one other thing that I, I think is important to mention on this is that um, before the PHE, um, the pandemic had taken place, um, telehealth adoption in family physicians was in the low teens, um, but after the pandemic um, was well underway, um, adoption of telehealth was around 94%. And this was facilitated by some of the waivers, um, but it's just an indication that um, if payment um, was a bit more flexible and the care delivery um, would also be able to have been ramped up in this in this regard. So regarding the second question, um, as it relates to the facilitators of the model that are important for um, the proposal, um, we think that um, any APN should be inclusive of payment models that are prospective risk adjustment, um, or excuse me, risk adjusted. Um, and so again, this mechanism provides flexibility and agility in care delivery, um, meeting both the needs of the patients, um, as well as um, what their families and caregivers need. And then the last question, uh, I believe it was around, um, you know, because of the waivers that were implemented, um, obviously the need for payment and some flexibilities around telehealth, is your APM still needed? Um, and yes, we believe so. Um, even with the waivers, the Medicare uh, payment system essentially remains fee for service. And so the PHE has made it very clear that primary care is not sustainable in a fee for service environment. So a primary care payment model um, that is substantially less reliant on fee-for-service is absolutely still needed in our view. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, Stetson? All right, I think I got myself unmuted. Um, the, the lack of, so what's happening during the public health emergency is the lack of capacity at rural hospitals during this emergency has resulted in a large number of COVID-19 related transfers to the more well-equipped urban areas from the rural facilities. And the focus on, of our model on keeping patients at the local centers helped prevent an, act, uh, an exacerbation of this problem by reducing the need to transfer neuro, neuroemergent patients. And the model could easily be used with other specialties with similar effect. And something that was great is our bundled payment um, we think is a step in the right direction for healthcare delivery, in particular to the rural areas where these services and communities are avoiding these costs. And the rural systems that are paying per consult appreciate this, especially those who have very few beds, some of which have eight beds. So they're just paying per consult and not a monthly service if they don't use it very often. Uh, some of the key features for our model, what is the need for adequate financial support for the consulting physicians, the technology, and the 24-7, 365 call center supporting this specialty care. Um, another is the focus on the needs of the rural facilities, communities, and patients, which is fostering the retention of the patients in the local area whenever possible. And then they have the option to transfer to the facility closest to them. Um, as many of you know, New Mexico is a huge state, so the individuals in the lower or top half of the state may be closer to a different facility than the University of New Mexico. And then also supporting the focus of the rural facilities on continuing education that we've been providing, which is it has been increasing uh, the local competency and fostered resilience for those health systems. And I know, for example, um, TPA administration went up, um, I think, 20 times during our model. And is our model still in need of a Medicare payment uh, after the pandemic? And the answer to that is the telehealth-related Medicare fee-for-service waivers did not have an effect 
on our model, the only change that was even peripherally related was the inclusion of provider to provider consults. The rates of payment for consulting providers under this waiver could not even approach sustaining the type of program that we have implemented and our payment model is still critically needed. Um, something that the PTAC model went over with us last year is the payment from the rural sites uh, goes for items that are historically not paid by Medicare fee-for-service, such as on-call availability, the technology platform, infrastructure costs, and that will all be necessary to have the way to ensure the amounts um, that are included in the payment for those costs are appropriate. Thanks, Stetson. Um, Jeffrey? Great. So like others have said, the COVID-19 pandemic has really been a game changer. And, and the use of telehealth in, by emergency physicians has really increased significantly. Um, one major reform that CMS made, obviously, that's a game changer, was waiving the Med Medicare originating site and geographic restrictions. But in terms of emergency medicine, um, they also made some um, waivers that impacted us particularly, including adding the main codes that emergency physicians bill to the list of approved telehealth services under Medicare and allowing emergency physicians to perform the medical screening exam, which is a requirement under the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act or EMTALA via telehealth. And that was really necessary. Uh, these actions have really helped preserve personal protective equipment and reduce unnecessary exposure to the disease. Um, some of these efforts also align with our use of telehealth in the acute unscheduled care model, the awesome model, such as following up with patients to ensure that they were following a discharge plan and then wind up back in the emergency department or in the hospital. But I think we have to think more globally and broader about the use of telehealth in emergency medicine. And it's really, uh, the, the pandemic's really kind of opened our eyes in terms of other, other uses beyond, that are broader than just our model. I think another um, thing that we are really starting to think about is how telehealth can be integrated into pre-hospital, so EMS care. And we're being we're very interested in seeing how the ET3 model plays out in that respect once it actually is implemented. Um, it also it improves access to care in rural areas and in urban areas as well, and it really helps triage patients, which again ha happened during the pandemic. Triage has been a key feature and a key use of telehealth. Um, I think it's critical in in APM to have that regulatory flexibility um, to provide telehealth services to patients regardless of where the patient or the provider is located and to have aligned financial incentives, which I'll get into, into more in the later questions. Um, and in terms of whether our model is still needed, at, uh, given all the waivers that were in place during the pandemic, the answer to that, like other panelists have said, is yes. Um, we we still think our model is critically critical to be implemented. Um, the specific telehealth waiver may no longer be necessary, again, if Congress and CMS extends these waivers to, uh, the, tele, the originating site and geographic restrictions obviously need Congress to act upon. So that's something that uh, a waiver would be to be necessary under mostly my models and, and our model as well. But telehealth, again, is only one component of the awesome. Uh, the awesome includes other waivers and financial incentives that will help uh, improve patient outcomes and lower costs. And, but, and overall, the model really provides an opportunity to redesign how emergency care it's delivered in this country by rewarding emergency physicians who are able to safely discharge their patients back home and can provide the necessary follow-up care to ensure that the patients don't wind up with a costly ED or inpatient admission. So there are other financial in uh, incentives and waivers in the model that, and will make the overall goal of the uh, model still very important to play out. So thanks so much again for that question. Thank you, Jeffrey. Larry? The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced our previous understanding of the barriers to care and the intensified need for telehealth. When we presented our PFPM back in 2017, we had already documented the fact that patients with symptomatic chronic disease accept their symptoms as variants of normal. As a result, they typically do not seek medical care early enough to avoid morbidity. We documented in our proposal that two thirds of the patients with inflammatory bowel disease had no documented contact with their provider in the 30 days prior to a hospitalization for a serious complication. Since COVID-19, this tendency has intensified. Patients are even more reluctant to seek face-to-face -face medical care due to their fear of acquiring the infection, even when they see deterioration in their own symptoms. 
chronic conditions are deteriorating and patients are presenting even later than in pre-COVID states. To correct this and produce resiliency in value-based care, telehealth must move beyond being reactive care and should be proactive, engaging patients even before they realize that they need engagement. This will re require changes to CPT codes to allow for proactive care. Technology is critical. The use of appropriate technology like our platform can leverage limited assets to economically and cost-effectively provide an early warning system for patients with chronic disease. Purely reactive systems cannot provide this. There is a hunger among specialists to participate in value-based care. These same specialists possess the necessary knowledge to provide that value-based care. Our physician-focused payment model was designed to create a reimbursement model that would foster the recruitment of specialists. The most significant facilitator is the financial payment model, which should be bi-directionally risk-based, but also include a mechanism for timely ongoing patient payments to the medical providers to manage a population of patients with symptomatic high variable cost chronic disease. Practices typically lack the infrastructure necessary for value-based care. The structure of current value-based care for most specialists is typically limited to shared savings, which are paid after a study period based on those savings. They typically do not include ongoing payments. This has limited their acceptance. During the episode, they are still compensated on a discounted fee for service basis, which may decrease as value-based care is provided. This makes the value-based infrastructure difficult to develop, incentives are not aligned, and adoption becomes difficult. Timely performance data is critical and must be provided by the payer so their practices can monitor their progress in real time. This should ideally be in the form of claims data. The reason for Sonar's success is due to timely, ongoing payments to the practices and data sharing by the payer. The Medicare fee-for-service waivers have greatly enhanced the use of telehealth and facilitated its incorporation into medical practice workflow. This has enabled medical practices to provide care to patients who would otherwise have been unable or unwilling to receive it. There should be no impediment to a patient receiving needed appropriate care. As I answered in an earlier question, our model is still definitely needed. Telehealth as it currently exists is still based on a reactive healthcare provision model. Patients with chronic disease are not consistently able to determine early enough when they are in need of an adjustment in their conditions medical care. A proactive system is needed so that care can be provided earlier in the deterioration of the patient. This will result in less expensive care. Expanded use of virtual communication codes could allow for a structure that, be, that can be incorporated into the current system. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate your comments. Um, David. Thank you, Dr. Baylett. First, before I talk about long-term care specifically, I wanted to chime in, especially on Stetson's comments about other ways that we've used telemedicine to handle the public health emergency. And so we really ramped up our efforts and created a hospital at home uh, telemedicine monitoring program and kept you know hundreds of patients out of the hospital through that, including patients on oxygen safely and stuff. And so that really accelerated some of that, that as well. And we also had uh, e-hospital program where we've got the uh, hospitalists uh, deployed to a lot of our rural hospitals via telemedicine that enabled our rural hospitals to keep a lot of patients that otherwise would have ended up in our tertiary and quaternary centers and probably would have doubled the volume of patients that we're seeing. And so this has been such a blessing to have some of those technologies in place for us. In regards to long-term care setting, I mean, obviously, uh, nursing homes have been on the front lines of the fight against COVID. And we were uniquely situated already having a presence in so many nursing homes at the beginning of this. And we got a quickly accelerated 
uh, requests coming in at the beginning of COVID. And so now we've more than doubled the 150 nursing homes that uh, we are delivering services to right now. But it's not just the in-person care. So providers weren't being able to come in and see their patients. And so that direct patient care via telemedicine has certainly been critical to this and, and been a bridge until uh, physicians and other providers can come back into the center. But it's also been, we've always looked at our program as a facility-wide cultural transformation. It's not just good enough to come in and be able to bring a patient up on camera and say, yes, that's cellulitis. What we found early on 10 years ago when we started with this concept is that you get those calls too late. They've delayed care and they're already septic by the time the nursing home calls you. You have to change the culture in that nursing home. And that's a system-wide intervention. And so we've always been involved with kind of three, three legs of our intervention. One, only one of which is that direct care. The other two are that education and involved in that quality projects that do that cultural transformation that's needed. And so that's been another very good use of our program during COVID because we've been intimately involved with those centers as we are looking at COVID, what are the policies, infection control, prevention, cohorting, all of these things, being involved in that and being able to rapidly intervene in those settings when they do get a positive and move to an outbreak type of situation has just been key to our response in all of those. And that answers the question of, is this still needed even with the telehealth flexibilities during that? You know, telehealth flexibilities are still a very episodic, um, you know, point in time payment for specific things. They don't cover these facility-wide interventions and the culture change and stuff. Yes, there's nursing home quality programs, but those effects are still minimal um, overall. And so two thirds of the things that we've done during the pandemic are still things that aren't covered underneath those telehealth flexibilities. So yes, still needed. Thanks, David. And, and so, um... I'm just going to summarize some of the things I heard and then open it up to my colleagues to comment. Um, but one of the Barbara's point about flexibility on the clinical redesign. So on the fly, they had to marshal um, telehealth to really keep patients out of harm's way and, and, and essentially redesign the care delivery uh, under the circumstances of COVID. Um, but I also heard from Heidi about flexibility and payment. So if you have an underlying payment model that has telehealth incorporated in it, it allows the flexibility to leverage it when you need it. But it, it's not um, it, it's not a one-off. It's actually just built in. It's re-engineered into the practice, and that that uh, payment facilitates that, and that flexibility is important. Um, the proactive point that Larry raised. Um, I, I it caught, was was very interesting, um, and that really the backbone of your model, Larry Project Sonar, was obviously monitoring, continuous monitoring. But it really became evident as you described it that, given the reluctance of patients to even when they have symptoms that they think uh, warrant a follow up or a visit or a conversation, without that monitoring because of the reluctance it has the opportunity to progress. So telehealth really, um, that proactive continued outreach really helps break down that barrier, especially when patients are, are very sensitized to going into facilities right now in the backbone of, in the backdrop of COVID. Jeff, you talked about follow-up and I know that ER follow-up, the physicians calling the patients was critically important in your model. And clearly, uh, it continues to be so uh, right now under the circumstances with COVID. Uh, and I liked your comment about uh, preserving PPE. Uh, that was a, an angle that I, I, I certainly didn't think about, but I thought was uh, pretty important here. Um, and then, David, your point about, um, you know, right now, telehealth is, t it's still sort of a, an event, you know, okay, I'm going to turn it on or I'm going to go ahead and use it. It's not it's not looking at the whole system holistically yet, um, meaning the true value of what it brings. Right now, the only value that's delivered is when it's used to some to some extent, if it's not built into a model, but a, a payment model, um, as you've described it in your, in your setting, um, if it actually would incorporate telehealth as just a component and a value add, and you don't get paid per click, but you just, you, you get paid for the outcomes. 
and telehealth is a component of driving those outcomes. Those are some of the things that we heard in the answers to this particular question. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up um, to, my, to my colleagues. Uh, If there are any additional questions, uh, follow-up questions that you guys have, uh, otherwise we can we can move on. But I just wanted to make sure. sure. So I had a question, a comment, a question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go ahead, and then Lauren, you can you can follow up after Angelo. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, so first of all, I just want to congratulate everybody as I sit and listen to to how you've used telehealth in all these a variety of arenas. I wish I could incorporate all of those across my entire delivery system because that would create a true integrated delivery system uh, using telehealth through every aspect of care I can think of across prison health. So uh, all, all of those are great. Um, a, a question I would have, and I guess mainly it's, it's around primary care and emergency room care is, so the technology for telehealth, uh, although there's still some barriers, as we know, in terms of just access and broad, broadband uh, access, et cetera, uh, that's become less of a barrier as the technology has improved. So I'm wondering uh, what kind of barriers you might have faced in terms of just operational workflows in your practices and in the emergency room, and have you identified uh, ways around those and best practices in terms of uh, how you're delivering that telehealth uh, operationally with your physicians and is it just worked into their daily schedule uh, incorporated into their regular uh, patient list or are you uh, isolating times uh, during the day or the week to have dedicated people doing this or what what are some of the uh, best practices that you've, you've been able to identify anybody Anybody's welcome, David. Yeah, so for our model, that's the whole reason why uh, we had to scale up of this because it's really hard to do this. Uh, I gotta have one patient that, you know, I'm managing via telehealth, the next one is this way because the need is when the need is in nursing homes. And so we created a multidisciplinary model that totally dedicated to e-long-term care in the nursing home. So 24 seven, we've got somebody only doing that so that they're available at all times. Cause that's part of that cultural change in the nursing home, as opposed to the old model that, you know, where I would tell a nursing home with a primary care physician, don't you dare wake me up unless it's an emergency. And so then they put it off until it's too late. You know, we're changing that culture. Hey, uh, e-long-term care, we're here, we're up all night anyway, give us a call type of thing. And so we just, but you've got to get the scale. And so it wasn't until we got the, you know, 60 plus nursing homes where we were really taking full advantage that you could have somebody full time and a whole team of people, you know, your social worker, your behavioral health people. And so you've got to get the scale to be able to do that, which is a barrier. Jeffrey, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, yeah, cost has been a major barrier um, to getting the telehealth programs and emerging medicine up and running. And I think they're, some reimbursement under the pandemic and the more persistent financial financing mechanisms been really helpful. But also, like was just said, it takes a culture shift. Emergency physicians, you know, have to go on shifts and and they're busy in the emergency department, as you all know. And then they then they go home and you know the the transition of care in the emergency department is difficult, and that's why a lot of times patients who are discharged get lost in the system. And I think that's the value of our model. And during the pandemic, I talked to a major. Uh, um, chief medical officer on the west coast and he's making an investment in his in his in, in his group to make sure that they it during that shift if 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 for some reason volumes are down and they have been down in the emergency department during uh, in some cases during the pandemic that they take actual time out of their shift to follow up with patients they've seen in previous shifts i think that time investment and that culture shift is going to be critical in emergency medicine Thanks, Jeffrey. And I know Heidi, you're going to make a comment. Lauren, you have a question, and then Jen uh, has a question as well. So, Heidi, please. Great, thank you. So, um, primary care and family physicians generally have had to completely re-engineer their clinic workflows to adopt telemedicine in their practices. So, they've really had to lean on their care teams not only to um, you know understand and implement. Uh, virtual or telehealth visits, but preparing the patients for a successful and 
um, helpful visit to them. So there's preparing the uh, providers or clinicians, if you will, but also making sure the patient has what they need in order for um, a successful visit um, all around. So we've seen um, a lot of pre-visit planning taking place, um, reviewing schedules in advance, um, having pre uh, telemedicine visits um, to make sure that the patient understands how to utilize the technology, and if not, having a backup plan for an audio only visit. Um, and then they've also had to really think about um, when you use telemedicine versus when that patient needs to come in and have a actual in person visit. So um, there has been a lot of additional prep and use of the care team to really help support mm -hmm. um, the, the visits that the patients um, and physicians are needing to take place um, from both an in-person and telemedicine. Great. Thank you, Heidi. That was very helpful. Um, Lauren, your question. Heidi, that was perfect. Um, lead into what my question is. Um, thank you for these excellent innovations and presentations. In my work with the National Center for Complex Health and Social Needs, I engage with communities around the country. And what I watched happen with COVID is a tremendous shift to everyone shifting to, to telehealth um, in all disciplines. So a tremendous interprofessional shift, um, nurses, social workers, community health workers, behavioral health addiction treatment. I'm curious if um, each of you are, would have a comment about what payment and policy shifts would you like to see? Um, or have you learned from utilizing an interprofessional team delivery of telehealth? Okay, this is Barbara, I will jump on to that. I think, uh, we are all very enamored of telehealth right now. It kept our patients safer. It kept us safer. But I think we need to, to proceed with some degree of caution. A telehealth visit is not as good as an inpatient or in-person visit because the physical examination still has significant value. And there are some interventions, such as delivering a liter of saline to keep someone dehydrated out of the emergency department that you simply cannot do through telehealth. I think we also need to be very careful about not exacerbating health disparities. For those who cannot afford a smartphone or do not have a computer, and for people who are sick without a caregiver to set up the telemedicine visit, I agree with the previous comment that it takes a lot of prep to set that up. Uh, for the patient part, we know all the Zoom meetings start with, can you hear me now? Well, so do the telemedicine visits. And so we, you know, in Mason, one of the things that we recognized early is that uh, if you can incorporate into the payment processes, the increased costs that occur for more disadvantaged populations, for people who are unable to come in, people who have no caregiver, which we found was a major cause of emergency department visits, then you can stop worrying so much about whether or not you're going to be penalized for taking care of that patient, but be able to use the tools that are available appropriately. So after the pandemic, I think we absolutely should continue being able to be paid for a telehealth visit with the patient in their home, not necessarily in another clinic where I don't actually need telehealth. Being able to be paid for the telephone visits are very useful with the caveat that they're not quite as useful as the other modalities. And I think we need is some guide rails around because the last thing we need in a country with an opioid epidemic is opioid prescribing telemedicine doctors from elsewhere out of state coming in and providing quote services unquote to, to our patients. So there are some, we can't lose track in our enamored state of love for telemedicine that there are some pitfalls here that need to be carefully considered. Thanks, Barbara. I want to get Heidi and then Jeff, and we'll move on to uh, Jen, who has a question. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Baylett. So um, what I would say from a primary care perspective is that historically, primary care has been um, undervalued. There's a lot of research that points to that. And so um, to have a, a comprehensive primary care team inclusive of an interdisciplinary team that you were talking about of social workers, um, community health workers that can really help wrap all those services around patients, it is just not paid for in the current system. Um, the APM that we have proposed is um, a, an, an increase in primary care payment as it's um, currently paid today. So it's looking at 10 to 12% of spend um, instead of about 6% of where it is currently. And that increase in spend will help um, family physicians and their care teams really provide the services as patients need holistically, um, not only in the practice, um, but also in the community, coordinating with specialists that are um, pharmacists and others. Um, we do think that the APM, the prospective risk-based payment model, will help with those services. So um, that's how our APM would fit into your questions. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, Larry, you had a you had one comment that you wanted to make before before we move on to Jen's question. Could you do that, please? Yes, yeah, so I, I would. I, I would like to build upon something Heidi said. Just about every statement she made about what's happening in the primary care practice is also happening in the specialty care practice. They we have to have pre televisit. Uh, visits with staff and then post visits with staff. This has become a team uh, uh, solution. And we have to work harder on improving and increasing contacts for care rather than imposing all these restrictions that we've been living with in the past. We need to make it easier. These are low cost services that avoid high cost services, and we can't be penny wise and dollar foolish. We have to pay for principal care management, which is a team-based approach. Thanks, thanks, Larry. Um, Jen? Thank you again to everyone for being here today. Um, I know we're using the word uh, telehealth, um, but really what we're describing are virtual care services. Um, and when we think about um, you know, payment policy there, are, we're starting to, there's some discernment between those two. So I uh, just want to just state that. Um, I'm curious, I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about, we've uh, discussed maybe some challenges, uh, and Dr. McEnany, thanks for bringing this up, around hardware and software uh, and, and equipment issues. Uh, and so not only acknowledging those two different um, requirements, there's also the who pays for it, who maintains it, uh, in addition to the services that are being provided over the platform. I'm curious your thoughts either, you know, allowing you to expand uh, around what are those challenges uh, related to um, the implementation, the maintenance, um, or the cost, um, especially as we are thinking about this continuum of care, ambulatory to inpatient, back to ambulatory, and maybe to um, you know, the facilities in the ambulatory space. And what are the implications from a policy perspective uh, and opportunities for innovation? There will be many who are listening here. Uh, and so I think uh, your expertise in identifying gaps um, also could help uh, spark innovation in this space. Thank you. So I'll address that. My practice implemented, this is my personal practice, not all of Mason, but implemented telemedicine in four days. And it was very expensive because we had to take the HIPAA compliant process that was available to at the time. It is not inexpensive. It does not cut down on staff time. However, in the Mason model and in many of the payment models that are being uh, looked at by PTAC, because we're away from fee-for-service care, then office visits and patient interventions, frankly, become an expense line item rather than a, a fee-generating event. So if you're trying to manage the entire cost of care to a target price, obviously I believe first you need a very accurate target price or you're doomed to failure. 
you need to not penalize physicians for taking care of patients who have adverse social determinants, adverse comorbidities, et cetera, which many of the current models do. And we need to be able to then look at all of these techniques and tools that we use in basis of which one is the most cost effective way to manage that patient and to deliver to that patient what they need at that point in time. Because we have all learned that if you don't provide those services to that patient when they think they need them, they will seek them at the higher site cost of care. So we need to make sure that we use telemedicine wisely like any tool, no one has big discussions on how I employ my stethoscope, but we do have these discussions because we get paid differently for them. So I think we need to very carefully embed them and recognize that if we can make it less expensive by keeping these tools um, at a minimal cost, if we can do accurate cost accounting, which is frankly the basis of Mason, to be able to say this is the cost of a 15 minute visit with telemedicine with a patient and not disadvantages the practices by paying less than the cost of delivering the service, then I think you've added another important tool to our toolkit. Great, thank you, Barbara. Larry, I know you had uh, raised your hand. Yes, uh, a short uh, addition. Um, we have been working very diligently on developing the, the cohort science behind getting patients to respond. Um, we have to recognize that there are a myriad of differences amongst the patient population. Some patients are fearful of electronic transmissions and fearful of uh, telephonic visits. There are others that lack the infrastructure, but over and above that, the personality differences amongst patients create sets of cohorts that need different types of approaches to engage them. And I think it's, it's critical that when policy is being made, that we are allowed some latitude to build the science that needs to be built here so that we can communicate patients the way they wanna be communicated with in a timely fashion so we can get these diseases before they get the patient. Excellent, thank you for that. Um... This was a great discussion. Grace, you had a question. I do, and I want to direct it specifically to David and Stetson. Um, so, um, and this has to do with um, the fact that there are certain populations, and you both uh, spoke about it, where telemedicine or, or virtual care requires a cooperating um, uh, entity on the other side that may or may not be the patient. So within the context of long-term care, uh, David, and I know Avira has substantial experience with that. Um, quite often, part of the issue on the other side in a long-term care setting will be, do you have a facility who is willing to uh, host telecare because you may not have a, a resident of the facility who actually can neurologically or because they're impaired from sight or vision or dementia or whatever cannot actually um, uh, do a, a televisit by themselves. So there's Q codes out there right now that my understanding is very few of the skilled nursing facilities knew that uh, were out there to help support um, uh, telehealth on their side in terms of the expense. Um, you know, when this pandemic made it such many of them uh, wanted to suddenly or had to use it. Likewise, Stetson, when you've talked in the past uh, about what University of New Mexico has done in rural health, a lot of your payment model was about incentivizing both sides, both the rural hospital as well as incentivizing so that you could have a neurosurgeon on call taking those calls. So my question is very specific for the two of you, which is as you all were thinking about your payment models in the past, uh, both of you, I think, um, had to think through um, the economic incentives um, in a fee-for-service way, at least if there was reimbursement um, from two different types of healthcare entities um, to make the um, advantage of telehealth work. Given what just happened with the waivers, um, how should we, as we're thinking about this with advanced 
alternative payment models that tend to be just physician or provider focused, uh, be thinking about these issues of how to actually incent the entire ecosystem, particularly when it requires both, both entities to be incented. I can see this also being the case in the emergency room uh, settings um, as well. I can take first uh, stab at that. And from my standpoint, uh, it's the complexity of that billing that's the biggest barrier there. And I think we're going to talk about this a little bit. But, you know, for a multidisciplinary approach that ours, it's got social work and it's got pharmacy and it's got geriatricians and advanced practice providers and stuff. You know, if every time one of those got on camera, we have to bill separately for that event and the uh, nursing home has to do originating uh, origin fee for every one of those events. And then we have to figure out how to build those multitude of events, not alone the fact that we're not going to be able to build for all the system-wide type of interventions that are episodic in nature like that. That complexity is just such a huge barrier. And then the patient copay is something that you can't underestimate. So if we start, you know, piecemealing bills for this and bill for that and bill for that, and there's a patient copay for every one of those, and so many patients in long-term care are on fixed incomes, and they're saying, wait, what am I getting all these? bills for it's just too much and so you know frankly we're in a subscription-based model right now where the nursing homes pay us a a monthly fee just to cover all of that so that we can remove all of those barriers and it's worked a lot better that way which brings us back to the need for more of a of a risk-based payment because then you don't have to put up as many rules around billing and stuff because you're getting the billing through the the shared savings and stuff, and it just cuts through all of that type of stuff. And, and then that allows for the facility-wide interventions and all of that, you know, just goes away. Thank you. Stetson, did you want to add something? Uh, yes, I definitely want to echo um, what Dr. Basil was saying. And I completely agree that we had to figure out how do we make this work and not complicate sort of the payment from the hospitals uh, that we're working with so that way we're not trying to receive the insurance information appropriate for billing and then they get two bills or what have you. And some of this I was prepared to address in the, the barriers question, but I'll, because these were all excellent questions from the panelists, but I'll try to speak to that a little bit right now. Certainly the, the lack of reimbursement from Medicare and private insurance comes up as a barrier to a lot of the health systems. There's a lot of other rural facilities that might be using telemedicine and they maybe are paying for several fees. So the implementation fee, a periodic subscription fee, um, a physician on call, equipment maintenance, et cetera. And we didn't want to complicate that either. So that's why ours is a higher per cost consult fee. And so that makes it a lot easier, like I said, for those systems who maybe use us a couple times a year. They're not paying all year for the service they pay once. And so that has been um, initially a concern with a lot of health systems. They look at the, the consult costs and, you know, their eyes get big. And then when they realize that, you know, if they're not using it, they're not paying, um, it's been uh, fantastic for a lot of systems. And I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but also the, the intricacies of the University of New Mexico is the largest health system, or at least the second largest health system, and I think it depends on how you look at it in New Mexico, and trying to balance the coverage of our practitioners as well. So they obviously have on-call schedules for this, and then there's also ad hoc, and we also contract with kind of a provider pool to make sure we can get to these systems within 15 minutes um, of a consult, so sometimes credentialing and I would say another thing that would be fantastic is that we're seeing the move towards the HIEs. And so for us, it's been difficult since most of the time the patient doesn't actually come to UNM to track patient's record outcomes or transfers because they never enter our system. So, you know, some of that is tackled by having direct access to those health systems. But when you have 22 rural facilities that use a variety of different health information systems, and you know, products. I don't think anyone uses Cerner like we do. It's it's quite the challenge to track the patient and and look at the things that we'd really like to to be able to give a really good answer for you, Dr. Trow. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Stetson, and, and this has been a great discussion and we have more questions than time to, to uh, unfortunately, but I, so I wanna, I wanna make sure that we at least cover the material. Um, and one of the things we've sort of touched on already are barriers. We talked about, you know, challenges with co-payment, challenges with technology, um, challenges with the actual payment model and flexibility. Um, and I know all of the panelists were really asked specifically uh, to prepare for discussing barriers. In addition to the what's already been talked about relative to barriers, are there other barriers that you would wanna bring forward we, before we go to the last question that I'll have all of the panelists answer? Um, so anyone has any other barriers that they'd like to share or lessons learned around those barriers, that'd be great. David, I see you raising your hand. Yeah, so I think this will be one that all of us will probably agree with, and that's the uh, interstate licensure and credentialing issue. And so we're in, I think, 11 states now. And as a physician, you know, I'm surprised that my fingers aren't black from having to take my Homeland Security fingerprint, you know, uh, the same exact thing from Homeland Security every week for another state as we add them and stuff. And, you know, how is that? adding any value that's just an unnecessary barrier in my opinion and so anything we can do to streamline that that process across states and make it uniform would be very helpful i think Heidi? sure i could just say i know coding was brought up but i would say the lack of alignment between payers on their telehealth policies um, family physicians on average um, have about 14 different payers that they're working with and each one of those payers has their own, you know, what they're covered, what they're covering, what the waivers are, um, what codes to use, what modifiers, and it has been um, a nightmare, quite honestly, um, for family physicians to help navigate that and understanding if they can get paid, if co-pays are way for their patients and how to engage with them when they're already in a stressed environment. So I would say the lack of alignment on um, telehealth payment policies has been a big barrier for primary care. Thank you. This is, Jeff, this is Jeff Davis. Just to add on to that, I think that's been a big barrier in emergency care as well. And also just the lack of certainty about the future. So what happens once the pandemic ends? All these finance incentives still going to be in place. All these waivers are going to be, is Congress going to take up the originating site and, and waive the originating site and, and geographic restrictions? So you make this huge investment and we talked about cost being a major barrier. And a study came out in emergency medicine that cost is a major barrier to setting up emergency telehealth programs before the pandemic. But then once the, what, what happens once the pandemic ends? Those programs that were established for the pandemic, are they going to go away? What, what happens to them? I think the lack of certainty is really a big barrier as well. Great, thank you. I would agree with that. And I think we cannot uh, avoid considering the fact that bandwidth is now in health infrastructure and places that have inadequate bandwidth are really going to exacerbate health disparities. We also tend to assume that everyone is very tech savvy my patients are not all that tech savvy. My Sandia National Lab physicists are, but a lot of my elderly patients, if they do not have a caregiver who is tech savvy, the telemedicine visit is very unsatisfying from both sides. I think that the rising area that we will have to consider in the future will be the liability issues and again, I have concerns about the across state line if we just open up telemedicine so I can sit in New Mexico and prescribe for someone in New York that I've never had a relationship with. I think we are setting ourselves up for disasters. So I think we need some strict regulation that says you have to have a pre-existing patient relationship or you have to be talking to a, one of those patients physicians for like the telestroke help um, so that we can protect patients from charlatans who, who can log in and convince them to buy all kinds of things. And they, they tend to believe people who are wearing a white coat. That's a great, that's a great point, Barbara. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, 
This has been this has been really uh, informative. Um, and I've, been, I've, been, I've been enjoying the discussion. I also want to be respectful of time, so I'm going to move to the last question, and then just sort of cycle through all of the all of the panelists. Um, and the last question is is simply this: um, What are the most critical insights that you would like to share with regard to telehealth and alternative payment models and the relationship between the two? and their implications regarding high quality care, optimal outcomes for patients and the transformation of value-based care. What are the key features? So some of it we've touched on, I know, but this is sort of your ability to sort of take us home, starting with you, Barbara. Okay, that gives other people more time to think. It's hardly fair. So the first thing I think <laughs> is, is accurate cost accounting. Really, this is what Mason is built on, and I think this is one of the flaws in our healthcare system is that we do not really know what it costs to have a patient in an exam room for 15 minutes, on a televisit for 15 minutes. We don't know our costs. And how can industry, of any industry, control costs if we don't know them? So as we implement telemedicine, which is a tool, it is not the savior of healthcare, it is a tool, we need to embed in that very careful cost analysis so that we pay fairly for these services, that we don't disadvantage them and that we don't disadvantage other services. We have to recognize that there is a continuum of modalities of way for us to deliver care. And we have to look at what is the appropriate use of each of these tools that we have at our disposal. Um, and use them wisely and use them appropriately. We're just at the beginning of this journey. I think it will take a lot of information coming from the field of people who are using this every day in its various settings. And I think the, the key of flexibility to allow us to use these tools is, is also important. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Heidi. Okay, so when thinking about telehealth, the AFP doesn't think about it as one thing. We think of it as two domains um, and two different delivery models. So there's the direct to consumer um, telehealth delivery model, which um, is exactly what it says. Um, but we also see it as fragmented and uncoordinated care. So we see that as one telehealth model. And then we see telehealth as um, a modality in a comprehensive primary care setting. Um, that's provided by their usual source of primary care that is ensuring that the care is continuous, comprehensive, and coordinated. And that's really where the academy sees telehealth as a part of um, a tool to use um, that's already been said several times, um, not as a standalone modality. Um, and in order to do this and for primary care to be successful in um, deploying not only this modality, but being more comprehensive um, and meeting patient needs more holistically, we need flexible payment and um, delivery models. And again, I think our APM that we submitted in 2018 really gets to that um, in the form of prospective risk adjustment primary care payments. Um, we know that um, the need for flexibility um, is not new and it will not disappear after the pandemic. So. Um, we really think that providing those prospective risk-adjusted payments will allow primary care to be more responsive to patient needs in no matter what setting. Thanks, Heidi. Um, Stetson? Hi, yes, we have uh, three main points here. Uh, first one's already been talked about, the expand of broadband services to rural areas. New Mexico is a rural and a frontier state, so that's been um, a pain point, not necessarily for the access program since we have been connecting to health systems that generally have pretty good internet, but for telehealth in general for the University of New Mexico. The second one, which I think is probably the most important of the three, at least concerning our program, is the focus on solutions which deliver educational opportunities to these rural providers, which allow them to treat more patients confidently and reduce transfers. So uh, there's plenty of apps or systems that might offer consults 
but just because you consult with a provider in a rural area doesn't mean that they maybe feel more comfortable or more educated or have the tools or resources to be able to keep that patient. Uh, maybe the academic medical center thinks they can keep that patient, but that rural provider maybe doesn't feel comfortable keeping that patient. So we found that educating um, and offering uh, free education to the facilities that have contracted with us really helped bump up that TPA administration and the, the physicians feel comfortable making that decision and keeping the patient, which didn't ultimately end in a consult and then a transfer because they just didn't feel um, like they should be keeping that patient. And the other that I wanted to mention is originating site restrictions have been sort of detri detrimental to the optimization of healthcare delivery. So just keeping those three in mind with the emphasis on providing the education that's provided with our service. Thanks, Stetson. Uh, Jeffrey? Well, thank you, Dr. Balin, and thank you all uh, for inviting me today. It was just a great discussion, and thanks again. And just to kind of uh, sum up what we've discussed today, um, I know we use the word tool a lot, a lot, but telehealth should be included in all APMs, in most APMs, it's, as a tool, like uh, that, that was discussed before. Um, and it should be uh, available to providers um, to help improve care and lower costs. The ability to provide uh, care to patients from their own home can really reduce the need for unnecessary repeat visits and inpatient admissions like we've discussed. <laughs> I think the key features to an APM, a successful APM, are stable financing mechanism and aligned financial incentives so that everyone involved in patient's care has the same financial incentives and are dedicated towards advancing clinical care and reducing overall costs. There also, as we, I discussed a little bit earlier, needs to be a shift in overall culture and, uh, and perception of the emergency department. We believe that emergency physicians as gatekeepers to the hospitals play a, a unique role in the healthcare system. But currently, when patients in the emergency department are admitted to the hospital or discharged, there's little follow-up from the emergency department. There's just so much potential in terms of value-based care uh, to increase value in the system by getting emergency physicians engaged in the care continuum for patients, helping to make sure that patients receive appropriate follow-up care and don't wind up back in the ED or admitted to the hospital. And as we discussed, and I just want to say again, telehealth is just a key component making to achieving that important goal. So thank you so much again for inviting me today, and I look forward to future discussions on this important topic of all. Thanks again. Awesome, thank you, Jeffrey. Larry. Last but not least, um, telehealth is here to stay. It's always been needed, but restrictive rules inhibited its previous use. The current emergency has opened the eyes of patients, providers, and payers to its value. It's time to define quality indicators for telehealth visits quality structure for these visits and real outcomes measures. APMs have suffered from restrictive structures. They need to be innovatively expanded to, to promote participation in telehealth for all providers. Although recent waivers and changes in CPT codes have been helpful, further changes are needed to create a platform of early detection of chronic disease. mHealth promotes early patient engagement which if provided in a clinically proactive fashion can decrease morbidity and cost. Let's not be penny wise and dollar free. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. And, and David, you're, um, you're gonna take us home and then uh, any questions, any follow-up, we just have a little bit more time, uh, any follow-up from uh, my colleagues on PTAC, but go ahead, David. Thank you, Chair. So, as Barbara and Heidi both alluded to, telemedicine is a tool and certainly e-long-term care, we look at that way as well. And we designed the program not to replace that local primary care relationship, but to uh, envelop and support that primary care relationship. And that's proven to be very effective through this public health emergency as kind of value added services to be able to uh, allow that to be more effective and, and efficient. And so it's been wonderful from that standpoint. But also, as we talked about, that billing complexity of any one of these new programs that include telehealth is probably the number one barrier that you're going to see. And having to piecemeal out the billing for different aspects of that, having to figure out how to put it into an episodic fee-for-service type of structure, even if their care management 
fees, you know, you have to put up so many rules to keep uh, overuse and ineffective use of those care management fees uh, that that becomes a barrier. The patient co-pays, that becomes a barrier. And so by hooking it instead to a value-based contract, a physician-focused payment model, that allows you to take away so many of those barriers, and I think that's why it's so effective. So my day job, I'm medical director of multiple ACOs, both commercial and public, including a moderately large enhanced tract MSSP ACO. And so right now, in effect, I pay for this product in our own nursing homes out of our ACO shared savings, and Medicare gets to come along for free for that, essentially. And I can darn well promise you that if I didn't know that this type of a telehealth intervention was saving the ACO money by reducing ED transfers, by reducing hospitalizations, and by keeping patients healthier longitudinally, I wouldn't be paying for it out of the ACO. And that's what that value-based contract brings to that. And that's why you can, you know, loosen the rules that, that govern all of this in that sort of a setting. And so we're very supportive of that. And as always, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk with the committee and this has been a wonderful experience from start to finish, so thank you. Thanks, David, and um, this has been a great discussion. Um, I'm, I really appreciate all of you. Again, going back, you all submitted proposals, so all of your interactions with PTAC, your passion around uh, care delivery and transforming healthcare, um, really appreciate your efforts all the way along and the fact that you were able to reach out and work with us to, uh, to build out this panel and participate today. Um, if we were in the Great Hall, I would uh, ask for uh, a big round of applause, but unfortunately we're virtual. So uh, on behalf of everyone uh, listening in and all of the PTAC and staff, we really appreciate your efforts today. Um, a big thank you all. Um, we, are, uh, we are going to take a brief break um, we'd like to reconvene at 8.45, but to give people a little more time, I'm wondering, could we make that 8.50? Um, I'm just gonna ask staff to weigh in here and make sure, uh, when would you like people to reconvene? 11.45 Eastern. Eastern. Yeah, for, for some of us, uh, that's 11.45. Like I said, 11.45, some of us are not on the East Coast. Um, so that's when that's when it'll be 11:45 uh, Eastern time. Thanks everybody. It's been a great discussion. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense.